Good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome into the Ball Quest podcast. It's brought to you every single week by Exterior Home Solutions. Uh, for a free estimate, go ahead and give them a call today at 865 524 5888. A lot of storms the last couple of days here and around the Knoxville area. If you have any type of siding issue, roofing issue, whatever the case may be, they can fix you up. Exterior Home Solutions, give them a call. 865-524-5888. I'm Eric Kane alongside Brent Hubbs, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis. Got a whole lot to discuss today, but obviously we're going to start this conversation with recruiting. Tennessee wrapped up its final official visit weekend uh, in the month of June, and it was a big one. 15 official visitors, uh, three or four unofficial visitors, and uh, a lot of positive momentum for Josh Heupel and his staff. Austin, you take the floor. How do you think Tennessee did overall this weekend and really the month of June overall? Yeah, I thought they really did well, um, you know, this weekend. Now, as far as the overall month, uh, you know, time will tell, but I think they, they really closed hard just this past weekend. I thought Tennessee did as well as they could do with Mike Matthews, did as well as they could do with Amari Jefferson. I think they hit it out of the park on both. I think Tennessee really impressed uh, Bennett Warren, the big offensive tackle from the state of Texas. And, uh, you know, and I think that he's really feeling Tennessee right now. Um, in my opinion, you know, Danny Okoye was as impressive a kid. Now, he was an unofficial visitor, but he was mm-hmm. as impressive a kid as I met over the weekend. And, uh, you know, I think Tennessee is doing really, really well there. Jordan Ross, Hubbard, you talked to mom. She loves her some chop, loves her some Tennessee. Now, does that equate into landing Jordan Ross long term? We'll see. But I, clearly, you know, he likes Tennessee. It's Tennessee, Florida, Georgia. Um, and, and I think Tennessee had a, a really solid weekend there. Yeah, they did. I mean, he's he's been up here, I think this is their sixth or seventh time coming up. Uh, so he's seen Tennessee a lot. I think the interesting thing with Jordan Ross is the timeline, Austin. Uh, he's talking about not wanting to do anything until uh, the end of November, uh, close to, to signing day. Um, he's talking about kind of waiting and see how seeing how everybody does this year, the first staff changes and that type of thing, which is I get that side of it. The question, though, when you look at those finalists, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, are all three of those options going to be available to him in November, December, or is somebody going to be filled up at that spot? Um, you know, particularly Georgia is who I'm talking about more so. I think Florida probably going to have room, although they're recruiting well right now. I think that's an interesting decision if he's really going to wait that long. Or does he get into the dead period in July and say, hey, I, I know where I want to go, and, and, and I'm ready to get this thing over with. I mean, he's taken a lot of trips to a lot of places. He's seen those three finalists a good number of times. One would think that he's probably got a pretty good idea of where he wants to go. The question is, is he really going to wait it out that long, or does he feel like he needs to go ahead and, and get his spot locked up sooner rather than later? I think that's the interesting storyline with Jordan Roth right now with, but between those three schools. Yeah, I mean, it's best laid plans, right? I mean, like, you know, I mean, you know, Winery, I'm waiting. And now there's a lot of traction out there that he could pull the trigger in July. Cam Franklin, I'm waiting. Now there's a lot of traction out there that he could pull the, you know, pull pull a decision sometime in the next four or five weeks. Um, same thing here. I mean, like, it, it's easy to sit there and say you're going to wait. But, you know, you all of a sudden you start looking around and everything's filling up. And, you know, the school you really like is only going to take one more at your position. And there's two guys. Are you really going to let some guy beat you to the punch? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, if, if you're dating a girl and you really like her and she says, you know, if I don't get a ring, you know, I'm going to start looking around. Like, do you really run the risk of losing her? Because, you know, you, you weren't, you know, 100-100. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I you know, I, I think that, you know, how this all plays out with him will be interesting. And then, finally, Braylon Russell, big off or big running back out of the state of Arkansas. I thought Tennessee um, – continues to trend well there. Uh, he's down to Tennessee and Arkansas, in my opinion. I know he visited South Carolina, and I think expect him to drop out of top three at some point, and South Carolina will be in it, but I don't think they're really in play. I think this is Tennessee or Arkansas. Kid is from, you know, Benton, Arkansas, which is not too far from Little Rock, and, you know, I will uh, I will continue to say that, uh, you know, the alarm is going to go off in his uh, recruitment at some point. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and, and, and it's supposed to be July 14th, uh, at 6.30 p.m. So, um, you know, it, by the way, is there a worse sound on the earth than when you set an alarm for yourself? No, uh, but, but full disclosure, full disclosure, I won't show the number, but full disclosure, that was my phone. I have that ring because that's the loudest, most annoying ring that there is. <laughs> and I want to have that ring because at some point my son is going to call from 
basic training in San Antonio, Texas, where he's been since June the 6th. And I haven't heard from him verbally. We've just gotten some letters. But it's one of those deals where you don't want to miss that call. So if you're sitting there working on something else and um, – you can hear that annoying ring from a long ways away. It startles you because normally it is a wake up call, but I went with that one to uh, make sure I didn't miss a call. I forgot to silence my phone before it started. Hey, so we'll allow it, but all the hey, other buzzing from all of our other phones that happens every single podcast, we got to cut that out. <laughs> well, I do have everything else turned off, but to, to, to whoever's uh, listening five minutes into the podcast on a Tuesday morning going, for the love of man, who has not turned off an alarm? Get out of bed. What are we doing? <laughs> Guilty as charged. Guilty, guilty, guilty on this front. I think, Austin, a lot of the conversation for this weekend obviously is going to you know, kind of revolve around the wide receiver position. Amari sure. Jefferson, how much of a move did Tennessee really make with Alabama having that momentum earlier in the month? And then Mike Matthews, of course, the five-star. Both those guys down for their official visits this past weekend, and it feels like Tennessee – uh, did everything they could. The question is, Austin, and you might not have the answer right now, obviously, but will it be enough? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Tennessee continues to trend well with both. Um, you know, they're you know again they did an exceptional job this weekend. Kelsey Pope, Josh Heupel, Joey Halsley, all of them, uh, you know, really worked Amari Jefferson hard. The whole family. They worked Mike Matthews hard. The whole family, and both those guys know how important they are to the class. And so, you know, Tennessee, you know, really spent a lot of time with Amari about kind of where he fits into the offense, how he'll fit. Same thing with Mike. Then, of course, Amari had to sit down with Tony Vitello as well, as that was really, really important. Um, it's Tennessee and Alabama. Georgia's running three here. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, you know, I continue to say Tennessee's always had the, the inside track here, even when Alabama grabbed the lead for a little bit. Well, and I think you got to throw in too a little bit of Boo Carter love here, AP. Um, yeah, for really both of them. All of them. For all yeah, those people we just talked about. Yeah, I, I think that he has worked that, and we talked about kind of how he gravitate people gravitate to him, um, and, and that one, you know, I, I think he did a good job this weekend. I think he came to town with the mindset, and, and Rob, I think this is an interesting mindset to have for a young person. He's just committed. He's on the hive committed. He didn't need love this weekend. He didn't need a lot of love. It wasn't his show. He was here to kind of work and recruit. And um, it, it feels like that that he put in the work this weekend to kind of help guys. It wasn't about him. It was about Tennessee this weekend. Pretty impressive with how Boo Carter's kind of handled himself here, um, you know, through the whole process, but but in particular since he's committed to Tennessee. Yeah, I, I think peer recruiting a lot of times get, gets overrated by fans, but in some, it, but, it, but I think it's a it's a case by case basis, and I'm interested to see what you guys. I mean, some guys are just pie pipers, you know. I mean, and some guys. You know, That's can, the exact phrase that people on campus have 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 used for boot card. Yeah, I mean, and you know, a lot of kids say, you know, I'm trying to get you know somebody else to jump in the boat, somebody else to jump in the boat, but just everybody doesn't have that you know that personality. The, where they can be around a group of guys that, you know, maybe they've met once or twice and aren't exactly complete strangers, but to make it to make it a fun hang and to, you know, for guys to want to be around him. And, and Boo seems to have that kind of personality. You know, sometimes you run across it. And, and sometimes, like I said, I think peer recruiting is, is way overrated, but not always. And I think Tennessee's whole recruiting – process a little bit is interesting to me Austin and, and and I want your I want your opinion on this because we've seen what Florida's done this year right I mean Florida had that big weekend yep a lot of buzz a lot of you know squeeze or whatever you want to call it there were a lot of guys who really felt that to get in the boat Tennessee's going to come come through the month of June and, and they got Boo Carter but it wasn't coming off an official visit high they had two big weekends this past weekend. They have not generated any commitment buzz at this point, yet it feels like they've had a good weekend. It, it It's a little bit different, it seems like, with Tennessee compared to some other schools. Is that fair or not fair? No, it's fair. It's absolutely fair. Um, Is it I, just I, the personality? Yeah, I, I think so. I just think that's that's the personality. Um, you know, I think that it would that collectively as a group, that's probably their personality. And, you know, uh, again, I think the staff as a whole, you know, um, just kind of handles things differently than everybody else. You know, they like to not do the big squeeze play, um, you know, which, again, sometimes I think probably is a, a, 
a hurt. Um, but a lot of times it's not. I mean, you know, LSU, you know, tried to put the squeeze on Kai Bates, and he still may end up there, but he did not commit, you know, over the weekend. And, you know, and, and tells me, you know, it's Tennessee and LSU, going to go home, talk about it with his family, sometime, you know, mid-July to late July. Again, best laid plans. Um, but I, I just think for Tennessee, it, it's kind of their approach, Hubs. Uh, you know, they, the way they handle things, the way they kind of go about things, it's the demeanor of, of the staff as a whole. And I think that uh, it, that's why the kind of the direction they go. I'm, I'm not sure they – I mean, could they go the other way? Yes. I'm not sure that's really how they want to go. Yeah. Well, and it and sets up for potential huge Ju- July for Tennessee. Yeah. You know, and ju- and July last year was huge for Tennessee. I mean, it was a mm-hmm. busy bit. They they made a lot more hay in July last year than they did in June, right, AP? Hundred percent. And and what it could end up being, and again, you know, really outside of Braylon Russell, who is you know, the fourteenth of July, um, you know, you've got Braylon, you know, uh, Staley who commits, you know, this Friday, um, but you could have a like a just it's kind of like Tennessee commit. Two days later, Tennessee commit. Three days later, Tennessee commit, and not like five in like a six-hour span like Florida did. Yeah, so I think that's kind of, it. Almost looks more like sustained momentum than you know uh, uh, you getting blindsided by something and then all of a sudden poof, it's gone. Like you know, it, it could be drag on all month long. You know, I mean, Ronan O'Connell's going to come off the board at some point. I think in July, Edmund Spillman's going to go on his lake retreat and think about it and you know, come to a decision and come off the board sometime in, in July. I, th- I think probably mid-July for Edwin. Um, you know, Mike Matthews, I think, is around mid-July. Amari Jefferson said late July, early August. I could see that getting pushed up, though. Um, you know, I, I think you're going to have a lot of names. Bennett Warren, somebody I think is going to do something in the next two, three weeks. Um, Okoye is not. He's going to come back and officially visit Tennessee in September. And uh, – and then, you know, I think started working towards a decision after that. But either way, like, you know, I think you have a chance to kind of kind of build a little stayed momentum heading into fall camp. Yeah, I think the whole approach to June, Rob and, and, and Eric, is really a fascinating kind of case-by-case, school-by-school deal. I mean, everybody's doing it a little bit different because it – I mean, June to December is a long time before signing day. And, and so how, how do you – how do you manage all that? I think it's pretty fascinating to see. Do you take the visit weekends early in June, late in June? How do you calculate all of that? Uh, June's a very strategic month is what I'm saying. There is no right or wrong. What Clemson did are load up early, and that's the, their, their you know, modus operandi, as they want to try to get out on vacation a couple of weeks early and not have official visitors those last couple of weekends because they're already hitting the lake. Uh, Tennessee's the opposite. They backload it. And, you know, I will say this. If Tennessee – lands who they potentially could land in the month of July. A year from now, I'm shutting everyone down on the general's quarters when they go into DEFCON because mm-hmm. one kid didn't come here in early June. Like, it, you know, it, <laughs> like because I think that what you just said last year played out. If it plays out again, that's two years in a row. And you just have to kind of know that that's kind of their playbook, right? Like that that's kind of how they choose to go about things. But I also think you can't be too naive to think, every kid is the same. Like you have to be able to read the room sometimes and know, Hey, we've got to push this kid because if we don't, he's going to drag this thing out. It could hurt us with another. So like, you know, to me, like, again, it's about reading the room. Each situation is different, but on the whole Tennessee, I think it's going to continue to do what they've been doing. I I just, Rob, I just don't know how you, I just think that it's fascinating to try to sit there in that case by case and say, all right, is this guy really going to wait till November? If he is, then we we want to we want to wait and bring him in in the fall. But then all of a sudden, if he takes three trips in June and and decides he's going to shut it down, then you never got a chance to shoot your shot. I, I just think that you better have a really good finger on the pulse uh, of the kids you're recruiting in the month of June to figure out how to manage the play with those guys. Yeah, well, I just can't believe we we live in a world where we just got done having thirty official visitors and at Tennessee and you know the last two weekends of June. To me, that's that that's ridiculous, and I mean you're right about it being a long time. But I mean I, I'm I, I completely agree with AP. You got You got to shoot your shot and hope you can get them back up here, you know, in the fall for unofficial visits. But I, I mean you guys know this. I mean I I'm sure the coaches so much prefer to have them on in June, even if you have 10, 12, 15 kids like you did this weekend. I, the the personal experience 
has, has got to be so much better than it is when they get here on a Friday night and you're getting ready to play, you know, Alabama on, on Saturday. I mean, how much, how much time, you know, FaceTime, one-on-one time, are you really spending with those guys? I mean, I, I know the support staff, the behind-the-scenes people do a great job with the kids and their parents, but is, when you talk about kids coming in and, you know, what stood out the most, you know, in, for these visits, how often do you hear about, you know, sitting down with the coaches, spending time with Coach Heupel, spending time with Coach Garner, or whatever, and that just doesn't, I mean, happen on, on, on the fall, on the game weekend visits. Well, I think it's a double-edged sword too, Rob, because you look at two, there's two kids I want to talk about. Both were here this weekend. You got Jordan Ross, okay? If Jordan Ross is true to what, you know, he's, he told Hubs, you know, yesterday, which is, you know, I don't want to do anything until November, December, then bringing him in in June is hard to kind of keep momentum, you know, going into the fall. You know, that means you're, you're dependent on him coming back on his own dime in the fall to kind of re-engage the momentum. Whereas Danny Okoye, you brought him in unofficially this weekend. He paid his own dime to get here and all that. He's not doing anything until September, October, but you have the official visit you can bring him back on yourself that, that you're paying his way to get here in the fall. So, like, you know, I think that's the proper way to do it. I think if Ross comes off the board in the next – 30 to 60 days, then you hit the nail on the head with how you handled him bringing him in at the end of June. If he goes to November, December, I think you potentially could look back and go, that was, that was not the right way if he goes elsewhere, because it was hard to kind of get the momentum back once we lost it, when he, when it drug on. I think regardless, you've got to get him on campus in the month of June. And I was going to bring up the Daniel Okoye, you know, method as well, because I think that's the perfect way to handle it. Um, but I also think that's why the this eight six five live has become such a huge deal. Tennessee backloads it. You know, Tennessee's waiting to get the majority of their uh, you know, the big weekends, the last two weekends of the, of the month, and everything. So, getting these guys up here for that eight six five live, and you know, that's unofficially and having fun and all that type of stuff. You know, staying fresh of mind, kind of getting a pulse on each prospect, and it doesn't work out every time. I get it. But I think that's why it's become one of the biggest recruiting weekends. It's just a day thing, but one of the biggest recruiting weekends of the year. Um, is to, to get them back on campus to where they're still – they've got Tennessee fresh in mind, and then maybe it's three or four more weeks before they get back up here, uh, and that's kind of the way you've seen it played out a little bit this summer and last summer. Yeah, but the, guy, the, the, the group that visited last summer for 865 Live or then called Rockets, I'm a loser, um, <laughs> and, and who visited this year for 865 Live, I think when you get to the end of this year and you look back and go, okay, these guys visited, they ended up here. What was our hit rate on people that visited that event? I think it's going to be extremely high. Yep, well, it was, it was a lot. Go ahead, yeah, no, no doubt. And, and I think Rob makes the, the, a great point too. I mean, how many kids are really going to wait to the fall, right? I mean, that's, that, that's, we'll see. I mean, I think you're seeing more and more say that, but they really end up bumping it up earlier because – their high school coach wants them to get it over with. Their parents are tired of traveling. Our traveling in the fall is just so hard. I think for this staff's personality and the way that they recruit, I think the out-of-season visits are a must because there's so much about the personal touch. You're not going to the lake and hanging out and showing personality you know, in season, as Rob mentions. It's a little more – robotic and, 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 and programmed, whereas this has got, got a lot more relaxation to it, which I think fits this coaching staff's vibe better than – I know the stadium and the game, the atmosphere is great, but it is hard to do an official visit during the fall. No reason they can't throw a wetsuit on in December for an OV and get out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got plenty, plenty of cover. I mean, AP, anything else uh, from this weekend? I know that, you know, the, these, these last two weekends, really the month of June – you know, plants the seed for what you hope is going to be a, a fruitful July. Anything else from these last two weekends and regarding Tennessee and some of these prospects? No, just be interested to kind of see how it all plays out. You know, does, does Tylen Singleton make it in here at the end of July? If he doesn't commit between now and then and he comes back, I think Tennessee's got uh, a pretty good shot. I know LSU feels really confident there, but, you know, there have been kids from that particular school that have went elsewhere, um, you know, that have left the state of Louisiana. So, you know, Tylen did not make it in. Um, back for 865 Live, had a family deal, and, and it's a real family deal. Um, you know, um, you know, same thing this past weekend. You know, but I do think that there's a little bit of worry. You know, he didn't, you know, 
does he does he get you know pressured into pulling the trigger before he could potentially make it up here unofficially at the end of July? That is something I'm kind of watching for. And again, the more you can kind of get some of these uh, 25s to campus, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think is is really really important. You know, you know, if Tylen doesn't make it in, does Chris Cole, the teammate of Peyton Lewis, uh, linebacker, does he make it in? Um, out of the state of Virginia uh, for that thing at the end of July. I think that's another one that's potential. Potential. We'll, we'll see if he comes off the board between now and when things open back up in July. Your roof, it's the most important protection against nature for your home or your business. That's why I trust the experts at Exterior Home Solutions. All right, so let's shift gears here. And, you know, with all the conversation surrounding Chase Burns, I think it's a really, really good reminder that, you know, the, the, the transfer portal, it's been really fruitful for Tennessee. Uh, it's really benefited Tennessee in a lot of ways. You look at some of those, you know, guys coming in via the transfer portal for football and how big of impacts they played for Tennessee. There's been some players leave, no doubt about it. But I think with the conversation surrounding Chase Burns, it's, it's a reminder that it doesn't matter if it's Tennessee, if it's Southern Cal, if it's Alabama, you know, wherever – it can, you know, Brent, it can really get you as well. It's it's a double-edged sword, and it can rip your heart out if you're a fan as well. And, and I think that's something important to remember going through this new era of sports in, in the collegiate level, and it's something you're going to have to deal with every single year. Yeah, welcome to college athletics in the new world. Um, and, and I'm not against player movement, okay? I mean, coaches can jump and do things. I'm not I'm not saying that that, that there's something wrong with players having the, the ability to do that. I know, Rob, you're, you're – you, you're pretty clear on, on your stance on that as well, and, and the players having a chance with that. Um, it's just, I mean, every year is a free agent year, um, and free agency starts in year one uh, with, with, with prospects or with players and, and, and signees and, and guys. You see them leaving after the first year. So, yeah, I mean, the portal can give it, and it can take it away, and that's just the reality of it. That's why roster management um, – Rob is so delicate, and, and I thought your point you made in the war room in regards to how the portal is changing basketball recruiting um, and, and kind of the landscape of that is a pretty fascinating thing to keep an eye on, and that's sports specific, but for the portal, this is portal life, right? Yeah, and, and on the hoop side, and I'm, and I'm not saying at all that Tennessee is going to stop recruiting high school kids. That's not sure. what I'm saying. Right. But but I think that, you know, when you can get out and start going to see, you know, after, after – before their junior year, evaluation-wise, you've probably gotten a pretty good idea of who you think can play in, in that summer. You know, not you know, there's going to be some guys emerge, but so my my point being, and I, and it's not just the Tennessee people I'm hearing this. You know, it's like around college basketball when you get, you know, start hitting the road with the kid's junior year to make a school visit to try and get him and his family to campus. I think that you know if you by the spring of that kid's junior year, if you're not getting, you know, some pretty solid feedback, I think you're going to move on and, you know, but, and you do that in a couple of instances. And I think the board that you're going to have for rising seniors, you know, going to fluctuate, but it, it's not going to be as big as it was, you know, five or six years ago, because again, you could, you know, coaches are looking at it, man, I can put in two years on this kid or I can go hard for a month, you know, in April and, and, you know, get half or three quarters of my recruiting done. And I, I mean, and, Believe it. I mean, Hubber, I know you can appreciate this. Coaches like coaching old kids a lot more than they like coaching freshmen. A yeah. lot more. Well, I mean, the, no, no comparison. Yeah, and the problem with coaching freshmen or the challenge with coaching freshmen right now is particularly for older coaches, veteran coaches, you know, it's the it's the mindset, Austin, that you're going to break a kid down and you're going to build him back up, right? You got you got to sort of tear him down and, and start to remold him. Well, kids aren't patient. I mean, you know what I mean? You, if you if you break a kid down too much and and start messing with him and, and his people start talking about, well, wait a minute, I'm not seeing you play X number of minutes or X number of snaps or this, that, or the other, you need to start looking to go elsewhere. You know, so it's harder to do that long-term development plan with, with guys in, in any sport now because there's – I mean, they can leave at any point in time. I think it is harder to develop players. Well, but it's also to me, like, you know, if you're that coach that loves to break them down and build them back up, like going to the portal is also something that, you know, those older kids don't really want to be broke down, built back up. They're older. Yeah, and, but you're going to take a kid from the portal you believe can play. That that that's. I mean, you're not going to take a guy where you look at him and say, hey, he's a – I mean, I don't have time for him to be a project. He's a one- or two-year 
you know, if he's a one or two year player for me, I'm only going to take him because he's already been productive. I don't have to tear him down like I do a 17 year old. No, but coaches still love to tear them down <laughs> and try to build them back up, even the, well, even the guys from the portal. But, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, it's, it's you know, kind of what comes first, chicken or the egg, because I think you still have to – you still have to find a way to recruit the prep ranks, but you absolutely have to dabble. You know, I think it's easier to live in the portal in basketball because there's less – football, I think you if you live in the portal, it, 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 to me, it's really bad. But I think yeah. in basketball – um, or baseball, for that matter, with less numbers, you can be in there and and flourish way easier. So I think each sport kind of is different, um, mm-hmm. depending on you know kind of your needs, um, kind of where you are. I do think it's easier to flip the script if you have a coaching change and you have a mass exodus. You can kind of flip the script and get back a little easier because of the transfer portal. Whereas the old days, you couldn't do that. You had to wait on these freshmen to become sophomores and sophomores to become juniors. And, you know, that took yep. time. And by that point, you know, they're ready to fire you. Yeah. And I think I'm, I, the part of the portal that I don't like, and I don't know, I don't know that you can do anything about it. I, I probably, probably you cannot. Um, it's just, is is the tampering. I mean, I, I think that's pretty widespread. And, and again, I mean, I just don't, I don't think you can do anything about it, but I, I, I as Brent mentioned, I'm a huge advocate for player kids being able to move around. But I, I do think there's a lot of, you know, pushing and pulling going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, the bad thing about the tampering issue is, like, how, how can you prove it? You can't, can, right? No. I mean, there's there's so many different ways. The, the only way you can prove it is if a kid decides to not go and he or his, his family go, here's the evidence. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's just really difficult. So I'm with you there, Rob. And I do think that – you know, obviously, there's impactful players that, that move in the transfer portal and, and football. I mean, look at Tennessee; they've gotten a couple of really nice wide receivers, some other complimentary pieces. Well, but has look there at the been quarterback a bigger position transfer. Yeah, I was going to say, has there been a bigger transfer in college football than handed? That yeah, I was going to say. I mean, you no. Know, if you get that quarterback, I mean, it can change your franchise around, franchise program. You know what I'm saying? It can change your franchise around. Now, whereas you know, a lot of teams are getting a star quarterback every single year, but that you know, if you are a star quarterback, you have options now in the college game. With basketball and a little bit in baseball as well, man, you can you can flip that roster 180 style every single year with with, with players from the portal. It's just it, it's really unique the first couple of cycles that we've seen, you know, with the transfer portal and kind of how it's affecting different sports. And uh, regardless, it, it can help you. It can break your heart, and, and you know you're seeing that a little bit now all across the country, Brent. Yeah, and it's not going to go away. I mean, that's yeah. just that's just part of it. And, and I mean, look at it. I mean, you look at what happened to Georgia. I mean. A.D. Mitchell's got four touchdown catches in college football <laughs> playoffs the last two years, and he's no longer there. Um, Bear Alexander, the big defensive tackle, played as a freshman, had a big championship game, had a good run in the playoffs, and, and he's off to USC. So it's not just a bunch of guys who are – you know, I think part of it is you think he's saddled on the depth chart or he's not getting enough playing time. I mean – I mean, look, Oklahoma and softballs won national championship back to back years, and they got people jumping out of there right and left, um, you know, to, to go elsewhere to playing. So the point is, this is, you know, what we're seeing around the country is not going to go away. You're going to see really good players. Uh, well, look, look at the kid, Rob, the guard that's leaving Alabama. Oh, Javon Quarterly. I mean, he was a terrific player for Alabama, yeah. right? I mean and, and he's going in on June 20, 25th? Yeah. I mean that's you know, a problem. So you just you just never know. And and so for a coach, the challenge I think is to have a feel for your locker room, to have a feel for roster management so you can have your options available if if there are things that come open. And again, in basketball, I think it's difficult because the windows are so screwed up. We've talked about that. That's not going to change. But but I just think in baseball, it's tough, you know, particularly if you're in Omaha. I mean, you know, you're sitting here. You're going to come out of this thing the end of June. you got about two weeks to figure out what you're doing. Most of these guys are off to summer league baseball somewhere. They're not taking visits and seeing things. The windows in those two sports for the portal it's, are really, really a lot harder than the football window is in my opinion. Yeah, as you know, I've, I've got something that will come out with Josiah. Later, later this week, but talking with Josiah about it, about just what we're talking about, the windows. You know, he he went in, he's trying to get feedback from the NBA at the same time. I mean, at the exact same time, Rick Barge is trying to build, you know, build his roster. 
for next year. And Josiah and, and Rick, you know, had a talk and, you know, we're very upfront. And Josiah was like, coach, I, you know, do what you got to do. You know, I know you, I know you can't wait on me. And uh, so, I mean, there was you know, no surprise at all on Josiah's part when, you know, he, he was working out in Florida and working out for some NBA teams and you know, Tennessee got a 13 scholarships. I mean, look, look at Brent said, look at these teams in Omaha. I mean, we saw it. Look at LSU. Look at Jay Johnson. I mean, you're sitting here and we won't get off on that tangent, but you're sitting there bringing in recruits when you're in Omaha, but you're sitting there trying to win a national championship. And instead of going to the Cape Cod League and, and, and recruiting some of these portal guys or, you know, making the rounds across the country, you're in Omaha. So, I mean, it's it's so incredibly difficult for the sport of baseball in particular and, and basketball, as you mentioned, compared to some other ones. We got about five minutes. I do want to ask Rob two questions first. Rob, Julian Phillips, uh, 35th overall. Grant Ramey called it. He called a shot and he left for the week. He said, I'm going to the beach because of that. But 35th overall, uh, what are your thoughts on Julian Phillips uh, getting selected there the first little bit of the second round? Yeah, I, I'm not, not surprised. I mean, it just goes to show that, you know, co- a lot of college fans don't appreciate what, what NBA scouts and front office types are looking at, which is all, you know, what they think a kid could be three or four years down the road, not in. Often, so oftentimes has very little to do with, you know, what they what they did their one year in college. If the measurables are in place, and happy for Julian, and I, and I kind of, you know, thought that, you know, based off the stuff that I that I was hearing, that he probably some someone probably had given a strong indication that, that he was going to get taken, or, or he I think he would have made more noise about pulling out and perhaps getting the portal. But um, you know, I think he's the he's the poster child for today is NBA draft. I mean, a guy that. Flashed, you know, some some obvious brilliance in college, but averaged eight points a game, and you know went to the NBA Combine and worked out for a few teams, and and some people were like, hey, you know, we can we can work with that guy. Well, he, he's that guy. You know, I always talk about the common fan, like my dad. My dad's like, Wait, he got drafted. Like he he can't believe he got drafted because Craig's great what, guy. What what you know the common fan sees is a guy again, as Rob just said, Hover, that shows immense potential and flashes of brilliance, but disappears but the nba just sees the potential and the brilliance and what it well could yeah be. and and i think i think the nba on the upper end of their draft more than any other sport out there rob is it, all about potential everything they do in the draft is potential because the game the college game and the pro game are different what the, what teams are looking for is, is different so those teams are drafting more on potential than than production than maybe they are in some other sports, particularly higher up in, in the draft, you know, that, you know, because it's not a very long draft and it's not what it used to be in terms of number of rounds. So um, it really is what you do at the combine and what you do in a private workout more so than the tape. I'm not saying they don't watch college tape, but some of that stuff just doesn't translate. Right, Rob? Yeah. And it's also, you, you talk about drafting 18 and 19 year old kids in, in basketball, whereas in, in football, you're, you're talking about drafting kids that have been in, you know, been in, in college programs at least for at least three years. You know, you, the body of work that, that you're looking at is far more extensive, and probably most importantly, the the difference in, in what a kid's body has done by you know transformed into by the time he's 21 is, is way different, you know, than a 19 year old when you're when you're talking about three years in a college weight room. So I just it, it's just more guesswork. On the basketball side, not that the NFL draft is any kind of a certainty, but I, I just you know feel like you, you you have a little more information to work with uh, on the football side of things. All right, last thing, Rob. The SEC put out the opponents for each team for the conference schedule next basketball season. Just a quick glance at it. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time on it, but uh, Tennessee's got two games against <laughs> Alabama and A and M. Uh, that that that's kind of tough, but it feels like there's a lot of road swing games, if you will, with. Georgia, Missouri, Mississippi State. Kind of what are your thoughts on Tennessee's opponents? Yeah, just the, I mean, not spending a lot of time out on it right now without having really, you know, studied what everybody else in the SEC has. But what just jumps out at me is some pretty tough road trips at Alabama, at Arkansas, at Kentucky, which you get every year, um, you know, at Missouri, who was a feisty team last year, knocked Tennessee out in the SEC tournament, at Texas A&M, a team that finished really strong, and at Vandy. Um, you know, a team that was, you know, kind of a Cinderella coming down the home stretch in, in, in the SEC tournament last year. Um, so, I mean, not, not an impossible stretch. I'm just saying that what my initial thought is that's a pretty tough road schedule. I mean, I think you probably got a gimme at Georgia. You probably got a gimme at, at South Carolina. And, and after that, pretty pretty tough road slate. And, you know, playing Kentucky, Vanderbilt, South Carolina every year. 
I, I think that's a pretty good pretty good deal for Tennessee. I mean, you know, Kentucky's always going to be a tough matchup, but obviously lots of fan interest. That's going to be a, a sellout in Knoxville. Vandy, in-state angle, very obvious again. And, and South Carolina, that's just a series. Tennessee has dominated uh, for the better part of a decade now, and I'm, I'm sure Rick Barnes is always happy to see the Gamecocks pop up on the schedule. 18 and 0, baby. 18 and 0. <laughs> <laughs> a jam packed edition of the Vault Quest podcast here on this Tuesday morning. As always, a big thank you to Exterior Home Solutions. You can give them a call if you have a need and you might have it later on in the summer, but write this number down. It is 865 524 5888 for a free consultation, free estimate. 865 524 5888 or visit them online, Exterior Home Solutions. Dot com. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to VolQuest on the YouTube channel. If you haven't already, we've got incredible recruiting coverage over VolQuest.com now from this past weekend, from the night at Neyland camp, the second one all throughout the week, uh, up to the you know second information on the transfer portal regarding all sports, and a whole lot more. That is VolQuest.com. Come and join our family on the general scorters. And For Brent Hubs. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, but I'm getting ready to unsubscribe to the VolQuest group text. No more alligator texts from you, AP. I don't want to see any more crocodile or alligator videos on my text file. That's a no-no. You know that. That's bad news. That's, a, that's okay. I've already, I've already sent it to the friend that loves to send that to you. I'm sure don't send me that. any more alligator things. That's not that's not healthy for me. That's what we know. It's time to wrap up. AP, AP starts sending funny tweets in the group exactly. chat because he's bored. I'm ready to wrap up. i got a commitment interview to do. <laughs> Woo! Uh-oh. Well, I emoji there is a mic drop. All right. Austin Price. Brent Hubs, Rob Lewis, I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys for being here on the VolQuest podcast.